working. Brett regularly advocates for equality, justice, inclusion, and the betterment of LGBTQIA and other marginalized identities in both personal and professional capacities. Brett, thank you for joining us tonight. If you wouldn't mind giving an image description of yourself. Absolutely. And um, I just want to thank you all for having me today. Um, I am uh, wearing a white shirt with some blue cuffs, uh, a little scruff because I haven't shaved in a while and my hair is pulled back. Um, and I have some nice glittery blue uh, nail polish. Hey y'all, my name is Raya. I'm the COTAD chapter chair at the LSU chapter in New Orleans. And it's my pleasure to introduce Nuria Newman. Nuria is an occupational therapist in Philadelphia. She identifies as a white, queer, cisgender, Israeli occupational therapist. She graduated from Thomas Jefferson University where she advocated for the inclusion of LGBTQIA plus related content in the curriculum. She's passionate about serving the queer community with a focus on mental health and has worked with transgender individuals in addiction recovery and queer youth experiencing first time psychosis. Nuria aims to center her work in social justice, equity based intersectional perspectives while advocating for increased access to quality care for LGBTQIA plus people and marginalized groups. And Nuria, if you wouldn't mind unmuting and giving a visual description of yourself, that would be great. Absolutely, thank you, Raya, and hi all. Amazing to be here with you all, and an honor to be on the panel. Um, I am white, I have short blue hair, um, I'm wearing a gray shirt, and I have ombre colorful nails. Thank y'all for having me. Lovely. Next up, it's my pleasure to introduce Jasper Pruvat. Jasper is a psychologist, trauma-informed yoga facilitator, and proud cat dad. Based on a commitment to trans liberation through accessible and affirming healthcare, they work as a specialist in queer and trans healthcare at the Dallas VA, serve in multiple leadership roles for the American Psychological Association's Division for Sexual Orientation and Gender Diversity, and volunteer for the Gender Affirming Healthcare Collective title, NOLA. Their spare time is dedicated to indoor gardening and increasingly successful vegan baking attempts. And Jasper, if you wouldn't mind unmuting yourself and giving us a visual description. Hi everyone, I am so honored and excited to be here. Um, I'll be speaking tonight from the perspective from my own lens um, as a white person who's non-binary and bisexual. Um, as for image description, so I have buzzed short hair with a little bit of gray peeking on the side. So I'm going for that silver fox. Um, I am wearing a striped sweater from the little boy section of Target that I feel super grateful to still be able to fit into because it's somehow my gender identity. Uh, behind me, I've got some art from some of my favorite queer artists in New Orleans, which is home, and my bookshelf with a collection of different mindfulness and psychology books. Um, unpictured but important is my cat who is currently deeply chilling in my lap here and will be a guest on this panel as well. Thanks, y'all. All right. Um, hi, all. I'm Ashika from Johnson and Wales University. I will be um, talking about Shannon Lynch. She is a white, queer, cisgender clinical social worker that is living in Rhode Island. Her passion for social justice and mental health led her to pursue a career in clinical social work so that she could advocate for LGBTQ plus rights and social justice in her practice. After graduating from Simmons College with a double major in women's and gender studies and sociology, she went on to receive her master's in social work from Rhode Island College in 2019. Shannon has worked in a number of settings with youth and young adults who are healing from trauma. She currently provides trauma-informed and LGBTQ plus inclusive care to youth and young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities in their families. Um, Shannon, could you please provide a visual image of yourself? Hello, everybody. Um, 
So visual image of me would be that I have a fat body. I am wearing a, um, well, I had to look at it, a silver cardigan, <laughs> long hair, um, long brown hair. And um, yeah, that's it. All right, so for our next bit, we have some prepared questions and then that we're gonna ask the panelists and then we will open it up to the audience. So we're just going to say the questions out loud so that we can see everybody's face and not have the slides up. The first question that we have is, how does your identity as a member of the LGBTQIA plus community influence your role and interests as a clinician? Yeah, absolutely. And this is a wonderful question. Um, so as a queer voice therapist, I use my privilege to work with uh, trans and non-binary people, often as a lower cost alternative, uh, to help them explore a voice that's congruent, consistent with their identity. Um, you know, I'm an avid proponent for my clients and patients, especially uh, who do have come from marginalized backgrounds. And uh, I also routinely work with uh, both queer and non-queer clinicians within speech language pathology and beyond to help them develop their cultural humility when working with uh, the LGBTQIA populations. And um, as I mentioned in my introduction, the relationship between voice and identity is a direct byproduct of my uh, clinical experience working with the queer community. And it's something that I care passionately about. Are we going in order or <laughs> anyone jumps in? Um, yeah, I'm happy to share. Um, I was reflecting on this question and also having a discussion with my colleagues. Um, and I think for me, um, I chose intentionally to be out uh, in the clinical setting. Um, I know this isn't for everyone and everyone has their own journey with um, how they're bringing their personal identities um, their privilege, like Brett mentioned, into the work um, and into supporting folks on their recovery and healing path. Um, and just thinking really intentionally about how can I use my identity as a queer person um, to normalize, validate, strengthen folks that I work with while centering their experience and not mine. Um, and I find that I do that just by bringing my true and authentic self to the work when, when clinically appropriate, not, not in every case, uh, but using that um, as, a, as, a, as a key of connection and rapport, which is essentially at, at the heart of a lot of what we do. Um, and then also just using my lived experience like as a queer person um, to identify the need for uh, more centering of queer voices in the workspace and opportunities for like developing queer programming by our like LGBTQ youth um, and trainings for staff. So really kind of building on that to shift some of the culture um, at the, the youth organization that I work in. Um, so those are just some of the ways that I feel like my identity kind of influences the the day-to-day -day work um, and the environment that that I'm in. I can relate to a lot of what you're sharing, um, just the trying to navigate how to use your own lived experience and physical presence, right, in the work that you do. Um, yeah, um, I mean, ironically, uh, early in my academic training, I was trained a, a against and really discouraged strongly against bringing my identities directly into the work that I do with clients. Um, at the time, I wasn't yet aware of how that expectation and that kind of demand also reinforces this narrative that queer and trans people are like too much or don't deserve to take up space. But I think it's worth naming now. It's something I'm, I'm working on recognizing now and unpacking. Um, and then, you know, now the clinical work that I do, I focus directly on identity affirmation. So my, my caseload is primarily folks who are unpacking internalized isms of some kind or are doing identity affirmation work in the context of trauma and often you know, prolonged chronic interpersonal trauma. Um, and so I've learned to have a practice of talking pretty openly early on about my identities and the client's identities. Um, 
I find that when I'm working with trans and queer clients, it can often be their first experience with an out trans and queer therapist. And that's probably in large part just sort of like byproduct of the settings that I've been in so far. I'm really excited for that to not be the case anymore, just <laughs> um, that. But, um, you know, given that whenever we have those initial discussions about our own identities and what the space might be like, um, I hear frequently from them that there is a sense of relief and like ease. Um, even regardless of whether we even use the same words to describe our identities or have other identities that might be different. Um, and I think that's telling of the extent to which queer and trans folk have learned that they likely need to be on their guard when accessing healthcare um, and how much they really deserve to feel right away that healthcare is a space where they can just like let that down and be at ease. And I um, and motivated to provide the conditions for that to be more likely to happen. I think for me, particularly right now, like my identity and something that, um, how my identity influences my work right now is more in a sense of counter transference. And I, I'm in a new position right now and we um, took on a client that is, just came out as trans and taking all of that, like sitting with the family who's not affirming of the client, it, it the counter transference is like boiling over. Like I, it's struggling, but it's also the work I have to do as a clinician to be able to like just exist as a clinician to be able to work on that. So that's kind of how that's been a topic in my life right now. So that's kind of how I wanted to answer that question is like your feelings about how your own coming out experience or unresolved issues with like family that can boil up in your work and it's something that you need to keep working on. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much to everyone for sharing your responses. Um, if no one else has anything to add, I can move on to the next question. And our next question is, what aspects of daily life should healthcare providers understand to better serve their LGBTQIA plus clients? What assumptions should be avoided? So I thought about this first question for a bit, but then I, I really started to focus on the second, which is what assumptions assumption should be avoided. And I think my, my, my response is avoid all assumptions because the, the queer community isn't a monolith. And so you can't just say, oh, well, this person is trans or this person is gay, that they've gone through X, Y, and Z. And so there, I'm sure there are aspects of daily life that healthcare providers should better understand such as the, you know, constant queer phobia, depending on the spaces that you're in, um, you know, not living in safe environments, especially, um, you know, currently with COVID and people staying at home more, you know, being in unsupportive environments with family is, is another thing to consider. But really going back to the assumptions is that we can't assume someone's life until we know their story and they tell it to us. Um, and so I, I think, to reinforce that is, you know, you want to just treat everyone as a, the human being that they are and honor them and, and give treat them with dignity and respect because um, it's not just like, oh, this person is queer, therefore let me run to my, my queer manual of like how to treat queer clients and, and act differently. It's like, no, well, we're, we're human and we want to be treated with the same respect that you would treat anyone and to avoid any assumptions, um, you know, even in so much as like family structure, not everyone is going to have, um, you know, a, a male, female counterpart um, or even, you know, be in like a polyamorous relationship. So I think there's a lot of assumptions that we go into situations that we need to be a aware of. Um, like we all have assumptions, we all have biases, like that's just a fact, but we need to be aware of those when we go into uh, spaces to know how to actively combat those and um, how we provide care to people. Um, so assumptions about aspects of daily life. So this sounds like a really OT question to me because 
we're kind of talking about the OTPF and I'm just going to like say it straight up. Every aspect of the OTPF is relevant. Every freaking aspect and for every person, it's going to be different, right? So for one person that could be dressing for one person, it would be community integration. And for another, it's going to be school participation and for another work. So it's individualized to every person and their environment and their experience, and it applies across all the spectrums. And I think that like something really important is just thinking about like the intersectionality of how the different environments um, kind of like play out in a person's life um, and, you know, whether or not they're code switching between school and home um whether or not you know they can show up as their authentic self at work um and and how that's impacting their role and their ability to function on the day-to-day -day, their like mental health and their physical health um kind of all all kind of play into that um and just like yeah just navigating spaces and you know also thinking about intersectionality and just how um when we talk about um queer and trans identities, like layering that with um, a serious mental illness diagnosis or um, BIPOC identity um, and how in one environment you may be experiencing racism and then at school you could be experiencing homophobia. Um, so really, really understanding like the nuances and the, the differences in the experience that folks might be having in their daily life in one day, but across settings based on their different identities um, and how that's impacting them like as a whole human. Um, and so what assumptions might we avoid? <laughs> Brett, yes, all of them. Um, and also like Jasper, to your point about safety. So, um, we, so we know that um, 70 plus percent of the queer community is experiencing a negative interaction with healthcare providers based on their gender identity and sexual orientation. So we can assume when we encounter, and not, I didn't say if, I said when we will encounter someone from the LGBTQIA community, they most likely have had a negative interaction before we even walked into the room. So we can assume, we can assume that there is lack of safety from the very first moment that we, we like knock on the door and enter the room. And that's really something that needs to be taken into account um, and needs to be recognized um, when we kind of acknowledge the power and the privilege that we walk into the room with. Um, also things that we shouldn't assume is that just because someone ticked off a box like straight or um, I don't know, like whatever box is on the form that isn't capturing who they are at all, just because they tick that off doesn't mean that's how they identify or how they identify in one month or two months, right? Gender identity, uh, sexual orientation, these are things that may evolve, may be fluid, not always, but at times. So assuming that we need to revisit these things and reassess and be open, open that door so folks can walk through um, when they're ready and, and open and um, need that support, that's a really, really um, important thing. And just because I might be dating like a man or a woman or a gender non-conforming person at one time, you can't assume my my uh, my gender identity or my sexual orientation based on those kind of factors, right? Um, and so lastly, I just, I wanna say about assumptions um, is just that I think we are so deeply conditioned to assume like, oh, that woman that, at the store, you know, the, the man that just held the door open for me, right? We just um, scan real quick what we see and we make assumptions about pronouns, about how we're, um, communicating with folks. So just breaking all that down um, and using that gender neutral language until um, we kind of, we have the information is I think so important when we're talking about assumptions. And, you know, this might be newer or might be things that we're already comfortable with, but um, it's just so, so important to, to do this work of breaking down um, those assumptions and biases that are so deeply political and ingrained. Wow, I um, would love for you to come just like teach my colleagues. <laughs> um, incredible, so much there. Um, yeah, um, yeah. In, in my response for this, I kind of went in some similar directions, kind of talking about kind of the um, 
cumulative effects of what the kind of overall context is like in dominant culture for queer and trans folk. Um, but to kind of tie it to what y'all are sharing, it feels like it's really a balance of not assuming that just because someone is queer and trans, they must have experienced, oh, there's the other cat, hold up. Hold on. Okay, I've got one who's just like a total mischief maker. Um, okay, so not assuming that just because someone is queer and trans, they must have experienced like invalidation or discrimination. So balancing that while also considering the likelihood of those experiences, you know, um, as a context and considering that as a context for how the client is presenting in treatment, right? So like you just kind of previewed one of my, my recommendations towards the end of this is just to not make, not take it personally if your client, especially trans clients are kind of on their guard initially or defensive, like that's a survival mechanism. The guard will go away over time when it's no longer needed and you don't need to make it about you. Like, I feel like I have to give that feedback a lot to my colleagues who consult with me is, you know, why is this client, you know, guarded or defensive or ambivalent about treatment? And it's like, well, who knows what their experience has been like with healthcare providers so far, you know, maybe it's not about you. Um, maybe this is how they keep themselves safe, you know, so. So balancing that, um, because even if folks were raised in affirming environments, like they still are existing in this larger dominant culture, which is deeply racist and heterosexist and cis sexist. And I find, and this may be my lens specifically as a trauma therapist, but I find that um, the extent to which folks are even aware of that, maybe having an impact on them can vary. I find that a lot of my clients are not necessarily fully aware of the psychological impact of existing in this dominant culture um, for a lot of very valid reasons. You know, one, the back burnering your emotions is a survival strategy to get through the day. You know, paying attention to every outrage, every moment of anger, every invalidation is gonna make it really difficult to move through your day, especially if you got multiple marginalized identities, um, you know, um, I think another reason why that experience can be erased is because dominant culture, you know, like as a function of whiteness, like thrives through erasing its impact and acting like it isn't happening. You know, um, that kind of gaslighty experience of um, not naming the harm and not validating the harm can make us feel um, over time, like we, we can make us minimize our own feelings and needs. Um, so like, for example, like, the landlord who denies someone's application once they see a difference between the name that they've been using and their legal name is very unlikely going to say like i'm being transphobic like you deserve better this is likely going to be really harmful um instead it's going to more often be like some other hateful comment that isn't it's hard to that uncertainty piece right and there's not going to be accountability of course there's not going to be no acknowledgement of how it might feel for you and how wrong it is um, and even when the discrimination is like a direct violent act, we question survivors, right? We minimize their pain, especially if they're BIPOC and trans. So I, I just like, when I'm thinking about what to assume and not assume, I think this whole, like, it's such a, for me as a clinician, I'm always trying to calculate, like, what might their lived experience be like while also acknowledging like they might not even be able yet to fully be able to understand and see the pain that they're carrying into the session. Um, and me pointing it out too soon when they're not ready might also be too much. Um, so yeah, um, I'm not sure how to wrap that up. It just, you know, I just see clients over time like struggle to see their own like reasonable painful responses to the world as valid or to even see it at all like i can't tell you how many times i've been facilitating a group for queer and trans folk where someone shares something like wildly harmful that happened to them but they aren't seeing that it har is harmful they're just kind of making a comment about their day and immediately the whole rest of the group has compassion sees it as not okay and that's definitely a pattern right where like we can we can we minimize our own pain as understandable reactions to this world, this oppressive context, but we can see it in others. And I think that's part of why queer and trans community spaces are just like so inherent, like so healing and important. But I'll talk more about that later when I talk about my suggestions. I'll stop now. I clearly could talk about this forever and I wanna hear from the rest of the panelists. Um, I mean, honestly, I don't, I don't 
everyone's kind of shared everything that I would have said. So, <laughs> um, I, um, I kind of just wanted to reiterate what everyone else said about like, um, identity is a part of every system. It could be a part of every system and in someone's life. So no matter how mundane or like routine that you want to believe that is a part of someone's life, um, question yourself and like wonder how is someone's identity impacted because of this? How could this be impacted because of this? Thank you so much. Our next question is, um, you, can, you can use it from your own personal experience or in your clinical practice. Um, what health disparities affecting mental, physical, or emotional health are unique to queer communities? So um, this is, this has been brought up several times and uh, I am not a trauma therapist, so I will let them speak to the trauma more specifically and in depth, but that is an ongoing thing for so many people. Um, and especially when you're not able to process that trauma, um, you know, that leads to greater levels of shame, that le level, those levels of shame, you know, can result in like substance abuse and other anxiety, depression, PTSD, um, you know, so we see routinely that there are higher rates of, um, you know, psychosocial or psychological issues, I, I say issues, but um, that people are facing. Um, in terms of my own clinical practice, though, I'll go back to my domain that I specialize in, is um, our voice is so unique to who we are, but it's also so related to what we're feeling. And you've, you've had those phone calls where you call your best friend, a family member, whomever, and you're upset and they're like, what's wrong? Just by the way you said hello, right? Like you, you can really hear when someone's starting to get choked up. Um, well, there's a, a prevalent theory, you know, that one, there's a certain type of voice disorder that can be a result of trauma, that can be a result of holding and repressing these things. And so a lot of my work um, in the voice realm really starts to dig into that in, in certain times when it's you know, they're, they're losing their voice. I had a person who went completely um, aphon aphonic where they lost their voice, just like mid-sentence. Um, and it's because dealing with these traumas that they've experienced with. Um, and so there's, there's a lot to, to unpack both just from a, a voice side of things, but also, you know, more broadly, there are these physical and, and mental issues, not issues, but um, byproducts from this trauma that a lot of people experience. Uh, um, and then as Nuria said, it, we can assume that they have had bad healthcare experiences. I've had bad healthcare experiences. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's really important to remember that validation and affirmation is like one of the best suicide prevention things that we can do proactively is affirm and validate people um, without questioning it. And, um, yeah, I'll let some of the other panelists who are <laughs> specializing in this talk more. Yeah, I want to mix up the order. I feel like we should like switch it up. <laughs> I was sure. thinking the exact same thing. Yeah. Um, I don't mind going next. Um, one of the things that I wanted to mention was um, that some um, some spaces or treatment may not be accessible at all. Not in like, I mean, it could be in like a literal like transportation sense, but it could also be because a domestic violence shelter does not allow trans women. They only allow cis women. And that is the reality of our mental health like and physical health. There are places that deny people treatment because of their sexuality, because of their gender identity, because of who they are. And um, that was a, um, that was the kind of thing that came up to my mind was especially in the DV space. Um, there in my, one of my first internships was for a program called the Network of the Red. And it was created because there was literally nowhere for queer people to go in the entire state of Massachusetts who were experiencing partner abuse. And they opened their umbrella for the queer, the poly and the kinky community, but that was 
that was because of, there just literally was nothing there. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, I, when talking about health disparities, sorry, the sunset is like right in my face. So I'll just lean. Um, when talking about health disparities, I've learned that it's really crucial to be very direct and emphasize that these disparities exist due to oppression and discrimination, not as a result of anything inherent to the individual or the individual's identity. When that context isn't there, right? If we just kind of assume that people know that, I don't think that people that people have earned that assumption yet. Like, I think we still need to keep reiterating that just because of what we're witnessing now in terms of the extreme transphobic violence in terms of what our country is doing. So I just, as many times as we can depathologize and pull that away from folks, I just wanna do that as much as possible. Cause you know, especially when talking about health disparities, if we don't, we can often, if that context isn't there, we can often unintentionally perpetuate the pathologies, pathologization of queer and trans people or imply that these disparities exist because they just simply aren't good enough at coping. You know, if they just like learn the right coping skill, then they wouldn't have these significant health disparities that to be clear exist like pervasively across medical and mental health disparities as well as the social determinants of health. Um, I also want to highlight that um, being queer and trans isn't just an experience of marginalization, that resilience is real um, and is keeping people alive and has for a long time. And I would love to have more conversations centered around resilience and the just like brilliance and creativity of queer and trans people. Um, and then, you know, circling back to my comment about the hostile legislative climate. Um, that is currently criminalizing, literally criminalizing trans youth and even in some cases their healthcare providers. I wanna be super clear in my response that research, research shows that health disparities for youth, for especially for trans youth, even those health disparities around like self-harm and suicidal behavior are significantly reduced when they are provided with affirming environments like Brett was just mentioning and access to the healthcare that they might need. So like literally it's those, those disparities disappear when they are just provided with affirmation, support, and the healthcare that they need. And so I, you know, the fact that our current legislative climate is pulling in the complete opposite direction, I mean, our, our healthcare practices and our law should reflect that reality, the science. Um, so I'll stop there. Yes, all of that, all of that, all of that, um, and literally what I had written down. So thank you, Jasper. Uh, I'll just repeat it one more time in case anybody missed it. There is nothing inherent in LGBTQIA identities that impacts health disparities. So that is not a thing. Yes, to resilience and strength and beauty and people are thriving and living their authentic self. They have been since forever. So this isn't something new either. I will share that um, working at Morris Home with trans folks, um, who were recovering from substance use um, disorder, I got to see, you know, firsthand uh, the lives of Black trans women unfold and how um, systems of oppression. So yes, if you don't have access to healthcare, so we need, we need to know this, right? Higher levels of cancer, higher use of substances. Yes, because if I cannot obtain a job because you are discriminating discriminating against me and I cannot obtain housing because you are discriminating against me and I cannot access the shelter because again I'm going to be like traumatized and abused there we're entering into cycles where folks lives and their health is impacted by their identities but again it's not inherent to that identity right it's the systems um, in which we exist and so you know just like um, you know, everyone kind of said, it's it's so important that that is how we frame it, and that is how we kind of like name it and frame it, so that we're understanding how to then you know intervene. And to the point of like um, you know everything that's happening in the political sphere right now, there was a study that showed that eighty six percent or more, like roughly that that percent of youth were saying that hearing the, these political conversations in the news, like right now, about whether or not I should be playing a sport, which is 
for us OTs, right? Leisure occupation, like self-identity, like all those important things that are happening, like hearing that that is a conversation, whether or not I should exist in a public space, like that is impacting young people's um, mental health. And, you know, for me, so I work with um, youth with first episode psychosis and we envision um, everyone being born with kind of like a bucket um, and that bucket gets filled with, you know, stressful things. Part of it could be like genetic load. Some of it could be your environment and stressful things that happen. And when that stress overload just starts to like spill over, that's when we see the onset of um, psychosis of mental health kind of issues really starting to develop. So then if we're thinking of all the stress that's coming from the environment and from, you know, family that's not affirming, school that's not affirming, all those things. And I think that's what we should be focusing on, right? I can tell you that there's, you know, more self-harm and suicide and, um, you know, all the, all the kind of things that we named, which are important to learn, um, but really thinking about how these things come to be and the systems in which they're operating um, and where we're putting our, our emphasis is really important so that we don't encounter like queer folks and immediately, um, you know, assume that there may be um, specific health disparities that they may be kind of dealing with. Wow, that was great. Um, thank you for all sharing what you all have to say. Um, Moving on to question four, um, it talks about intersectionality and that has been brought up in uh, some responses tonight, but question four asks, how does intersectionality play a role in your work, either personally or with your client populations? And with this question, if we could start with Jasper first. Sure, yeah. Um, so I, um, I'm currently working at the Dallas VA and um, specifically I work with queer and trans veterans um, who rarely have only one marginalized identity. Um, and so my clients are often, you know, BIPOC, working class, um, chronic health conditions, disabilities, um, often have directly experienced or are experiencing housing insecurity or food insecurity. Um, history of incarceration, just a lot of systemic violence that they endure. Um, so intersectionality is, you know, a, a piece of like from the beginning, right? Like from conceptualization of what's going on to treatment planning to how I build up our therapeutic alliance. And it's, it's all, it's all there. Um, and I'm aware of the, well, let me back up. I try to be aware of my limitations as a white person, as a thin, able-bodied white person. Um, and I know that I will always have a gap between where I want to be with that and where I will be in practice. Um, and that gap is my own responsibility. Um, and so I, you know, also, you know, I hinted earlier that my training didn't necessarily include a lot of cultural emphasis and intersectionality. So I've had to kind of like go out of my way to find spaces that will be more accountability spaces to help me really push forward and acknowledging where that gap exists and shows up in my work. Um, and then something I was reflecting on when I saw this question was like a recent thing I've noticed at work, like a like light bulb moment where um, I recently noticed that the referrals I'm getting are have a larger proportion of white folks than the general population served by my mental health team at this whole hospital. Um, and I, I think this is in part because the folks who, the, my colleagues who are referring clients to me don't necessarily, or may not necessarily be considering the intersectionality of race, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and gender identity. I think it's like, there's this, there's this bias that like you couldn't possibly be black or indigenous and queer or like an assumption of like, I, I don't have a lens because the image of what it means to be queer is often so white, just dominantly. So I think we'll talk more about that probably in the next question about visibility. But so there are likely some implicit biases and just who my colleagues think need to be referred to the queer trans therapist, um, if that makes sense. Um, so I'm actively working with my supervisor to like figure out how to resolve this. Um, and Yeah, I think that's, that's, that's it for that.
I'll go next. Um, <laughs> wow, desperate. Yes, I think, um, I think, so for me, most of the youth we serve are black young men um, from like Philadelphia, again, um, intersection of like multiple marginalized and underserved um, communities. And, you know, definitely tapping into cultural reflexivity and noticing when I am not the expert. For, so first of all, every person is the expert in, in their lived experience and their story. Um, and when I may not be the person to support them in something that they need and knowing that, yes, we as OTs, we have a lot of skills and a lot of skill sets and a lot of domains. Nevertheless, um, if your identities don't um, intersect with the person, or even if they do, right, right there's so much room for um, just recognizing the, the power imbalance between the therapist and the person that you're serving and how to best support them with other resources, other communities, um, and additional additional resources outside of what you can um, bring to the table and what you can help with. And, you know, with the question of intersectionality, I also think that it is um, really important for us to be doing the work continuously. So ongoing learning and ongoing growth and not asking the folks with intersecting identities to educate us um, on their lived experiences, on the challenges that they face and, and what they need. That is not their role. Um, so we need to be putting in the work and we need to be supporting and holding space um, and recognizing um, our limitations, um, like Jasper said. And I think that um, really, like I really do try to shift the mindset of like helping, like that the helping profession um, and, and really kind of find myself trying to move into just holding space um, and, and trying to, to bring the support that I can to, to someone on their journey. Um, but yeah, I think intersectionality is just something that we really don't bring in enough. We kind of look at things in isolation a lot of time, um, but that's not how, how folks experience it. So it, it is a, such an important um, kind of shift in mindset that we need to bring to the work when we're supporting, like supporting folks and their families. Um, I also wanted to, um, I mean, piggyback on everything that's been said, but also kind of mention that like my experience with intersectionality has been that I've had to force it in. Like I've had to like bring things to supervisors' attentions. I've had to bring things to directors' attentions. Like even like I, I graduated with my master's in 2019. So it's it was two years ago, but still two years ago, intersectionality was not a word. It was not a part of the vernacular of professors in the master's program. It's still, it's, I don't think it is I mean, most of the people in the audience are, are students, right? So, I mean, really reflect on your curriculum that you're learning right now. How often has race been talked about? How much has ability been talked about? How much has gender identity? A any of the things that are incorporated with intersectionality, like anything that it oppresses, is not oppresses somebody, sorry. I'm a little heated right now, obviously. <laughs> um, but like, anything that someone is oppressed because really think and ask yourself how often is that being talked about in my classes and like raise your voice up and say like that was a prime opportunity to talk about this specific subject why why wasn't this talked about it activism even within your own education is an important role Shannon, I'll just add to that. I completely agree. Like, and, and I think in the times when it was talked about in my training, it was because students brought it up, right? It's like, there's this burden on students to have to bring that up. And especially when there are students with multiple marginalized identities, right? Across that power differential, like you're being evaluated by these folks and then you have to teach them about your experience and ask them directly for the training they should be providing you anyway. 
I clearly also get fired up about this, but like, yeah, I, 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 I was just kind of reflecting on your, your prompt and I was like, yeah, it's been discussed, but initiated by students, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Echoing everything that everyone has said already is wonderful. Um, you know, and I think it's really important to remind or to remember that, you know, these intersecting systems of oppression compound off of each other, right? And so it's really important to consider intersectionality because it, things don't exist in, in isolation, like that you have to, you, you're obligated to, and it's, um, I'm glad that this is being talked about more. And yes, as Jasper mentioned, we have to be able to find ways to hold ourselves accountable and to um, not put the burden on other people to educate us. Um, and yeah, wonderful, wonderful talk so far. And you know, clinically, I, I thought about this uh, in client populations too. Is speech language pathology? They're the the field that is the they're the ordained ministers of how people communicate. I several times now I've had children sent to me who just spoke a different dialect and they're like has a language disorder and I'm like no and like but it's because you know other fields and people within my field um, aren't thinking about it in this way and so um, again my my research of looking at how we communicate an identity like that, that's why they go together um, you know we we communication is super intimate um, but uh, yeah that's the only other thing I wanted to add. Um, thank you all for that. Um, so we should move on to question five. Um, so are there any identities within the LGBTQ plus community that you think are overlooked? And what can be what can we do to improve visibility? Shannon, do you want to go first? I feel like you haven't had the go first chance yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, the first thing that I thought about when I read the prompt was asexuality. Um, I think that a lot of people do not know that asexuality exists. Um, I think a lot of clinical providers also pathologize it and see it as a deficit and not as someone's um, I think that, I think a lot of people like to make the joke of like LGBT, like, what does that even mean? Or there's so many like things, a part of the, a part of that phrase that you guys have. And it's like, it's important to learn about every single identity because every identity exists for a reason in the sense that like, everyone's experience is different. We can't just, we, we can't just talk about, so I have lost my train of thought. I apologize. <laughs> but I invite someone else to, to go. Um, I'll jump in. So um, yeah, I guess from my lens, I really see like the young people um, that I get to, to work with um, and serve. And I'm thinking about folks with um, on the intersection of like different identities. So like in the autistic community um, and the disability community and how uh, voices of folks who are autistic and queer or disabled and queer often get um, kind of even pushed to the side or not heard or not included, right? If events aren't accessible um, within the queer community, they're leaving out um, a large portion of, of folks who are already um, just experiencing lack of access. Um, and then, you know, like other um, groups that came to mind were like the bi community and just folks who often get kind of, again, pushed to the side or um, don't have their voices or experiences 
centered as much as some of the other groups. Um, and then, you know, just to kind of tie in what we've been talking about a lot is just, I think that um, overrepresentation of whiteness um, and how um, white queer folks um, open more doors or pull in more white queer folks into conversations, specifically like non-TGNC, so trans and gender non-conforming folks. Um, and so just um, noticing that um, within the queer community, again, there are many groups who don't get, um, whose voices are not um, heard or centered as much as some of the other groups and thinking about ways to shift those power imbalances and notice when things are happening and calling them out and then actively working to change the way things are and not kind of just um, continuing on with the flow. I feel like if ever there was a time to like change things, I think that like 2020 and 2021, like it, it almost feels to me like it has to be now that we're kind of, we have to step up and like say, you know, within the community, these groups, these folks aren't um, included, aren't celebrated, aren't um, enhanced in the way that, you know, everyone should be. Um, yeah, uh, absolutely. I, I also had written down, you know, um, disabled individuals, bisexual erasure is a real thing. Um, I, and as much as I, I really do appreciate um, the cultural spotlight being on trans non-binary people, there are so many other gender expansive identities that like aren't recognized or talked about, demi boys, demi girls, gender queer, gender fluidity, like all of this exists. And it's not just like, oh, well, you are, you either fall into this binary or the other third option isn't being non-binary. Like, well, it's actually, Gender is not just those three boxes, right? Um, and so I, I know people like to reduce things down to simplicity, but really understanding um, our views, you know, because these, these communities are often overlooked um, and aromantic and asexual people as well. Um, and one thought I had while through this when we were talking about visibility is visibility is really important and I, I do really um, you know promote and I think it's important that to have visibility for these other identities um, but you have to keep in mind that especially as we've talked about being queer or a queer person of color isn't always safe like these are some of the people who are most at risk for violence just walking down the street so being visible isn't always you know i think if it places an onus on them to be like oh expect them to be visible when their whole safety might be around not being visible in certain contexts and that's really important and so when we talk about visibility yes it's important um but we need to keep that in mind as well for not everyone can be visible and that's why it's so important to use this inclusive language with everyone that you're using because the you know the person you're talking to might not be out to you and you you know you are now telling them or they are going to pick up that this is not a safe environment even if you think otherwise it would be um so you know i, I just uh, my thoughts on visibility um and all of that so yeah um yeah and my reflections i you know shared a lot of i reflected a lot on you know what y'all have shared um, you know, queer spaces continue to be dominated by white people and whiteness. I think this panel reflects that, sadly. Um, um, and I think those spaces in particular, like not just whiteness and, and white people, but white gay cis men in particular hold a lot of power and take up a lot of space in queer spaces. Um, and then in terms of trans spaces tend to be dominated by white binary trans people. Um, you know, as a non-binary person, I kind of have that lens that, you know, for example, like I have a support group that I offer for trans and gender expansive people. And I have a kind of like community norm guideline that I offer at the beginning because I've learned to, you know, those boundaries are easy to assert if you've made them clear earlier on that, that violent statements often happen that really erases and um, harms non-binary people because, for a lot of folks who are binary trans, like being in that binary has been equated with safety for a long time, especially if I'm working with older folks. So, but that's taking me on a whole other thing. But um, so in terms of visibility, so similarly around like whiteness and queer spaces and um, 
their the a image of what it means to be non-binary continues to be equated with being thin, white, and androgynous. Um, I'm fully aware I'm part of the problem. I know. <laughs> um, um, and this goes despite the lived experiences of Black and Indigenous gender expansive people for centuries, like centuries, you know? And um, I love Elliot Page, but like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, and then like, meanwhile, in terms of visibility, the wider context of dominant culture here in the United States is that like our country is actively making people invisible and erasing them and by um, making them disappear right through like police violence where I could just say policing because those are synonymous, um, incarceration and deportation, right? Like literally invisibilizing this community, especially those who are most marginalized. Um, and in terms of what we can do, I've learned that we need to divest from power hierarchies in particular in our organizing spaces and capitalism um, and take meaningful actions on what black queer feminists have been like telling us all along. You know, um, none of what we said today is like new or original. Um, and then in terms of in academics, um, and again, I hope that wasn't harsh. I think we all have a lot of creativity, but you know what I mean by that, right? Like queer theory is not new for us. Um, and then in academics, like more community-led qualitative research with real accountability afterwards for taking actions on what you learn in that research. Um, I think a lot of the times the trans community in particular is just exhausted of being used for research and then ignored um, and then not followed up with, right? Um, and then also professional pipelines so that folks can see themselves and their healthcare providers, that visibility piece there too. What a perfect segue into our final pre-baked question, um, which I'll read, but then I also wanted to weave in. So the question is, what tangible steps can students and clinicians take to provide more inclusive care? And the last question ended on what can we do to improve visibility? And I think that they're very closely linked, but I think that what delineates them is the action taken, right? So visibility has to be if the person feels safe or if they're not being seen because of various systems of oppression or people's inherent isms. And this question speaks directly to what tangible steps can we do? So we've all felt the fire. Some of you have even named that you have personally in this panel moment felt the fire of the injustices. Like there's a panel right now, we're talking about this together because there's something to talk about. Um, in, in, with regard to health disparities. And so what tangible steps can we now do? This would all be for naught unless we could go and then take tangible action steps to do something. I'm very much a doer. And so I'm curious what advice you would have to impart to us or that you found to be successful. Also totally fine if you say, I don't know, because it can be really frustrating. Um, thanks Teresa for putting it into the chat. Ooh, I'll go, I'll go. Yes, there's fire. There is fire. So let's just say it like it is. The OT profession, along with a lot of, a lot of other um, healthcare professions, are shaped and have been established based on dominant narratives, right? White walking, middle class women shaped our assessment tools, our textbooks, our um, evaluation methods, everything, not everything, a lot of what we learn. There are, have also been some fantastic founders, um, but the majority of the content that is coming to you is filtered through very particular lenses. And I'll speak to my educational journey, which was lacking greatly. Um, and I know that that reflects this, the experiences of other students across the state. So I don't think that's unique. Um, so I'm calling on you to be critical consumers of the information that you're receiving and how that's going to inform your education. So if, if you are not hearing queer, trans, um, LGBTQ narrative stories, case studies, research, A, call that out. You do not have to be from a community to speak up when information is lacking, right? So you can highlight that, call that out, do your own research, bring the paperwork to your faculty, show them the statistics, show them the information and let them know 
you're paying a lot of money, friends, a lot of money, right? They should be educating us on the information that is out there. It is out there, not all of it, but there is some. And if we don't make the shift, I, I, I'm on the AOTA DEI task force. So I'm just going to put it out there. The change I believe is coming bottom up, not top down at this point. That's how I'm going to pursue my career. And that's how I encourage y'all to go out there into the world. Um, so we will push them because this is important. Um, so we will educate ourselves. We will um, encourage information to be included in education on a personal level. When you get into field work, you can have these conversations with your um, CIs, with your clinical instructors. You can have conversations about language, model it yourselves, right? Gender neutral language until we know the person's pronoun. It doesn't matter what they look like. We don't know their pronouns until they have shared theirs. So we may share theirs. Hi, my name is Nuria. My pronouns are she, her. I'm from occupational therapy department. You know, what is your name or how would you like to be referred to? Um, and modeling that in everything we do. Check your assessment forms. Check the forms that we are using. If it's in school, if it's in the clinic, if it's not inclusive, we change it, right? Scrap it, burn it up, write the new ones. Y'all are gonna be the ones who are doing the case studies. Y'all are gonna be the ones that are in research studies. Y'all are be the, gonna be the ones that are writing textbooks, right? So when we step in, that's when we can pull in all these things that we know that are important. But keep in mind, I don't think that the people that are currently like shaping things are really leading us down a transformational path, but I know all of us here up here <laughs> believe, and hopefully y'all are also believing in that there's a big force of us that believe in this change. And then we can take those um, actionable kind of um, steps. The, the only last thing that I wanna say that goes to Jasper's point about uh, pathways or pipelines um, is that we need to be putting money into this. So if y'all have a speaker, and they are a black trans woman, she needs to be paid for her labor and her time. And if it's research and y'all are asking for labor, folks need to be paid and compensated for their time and their energy. Um, and so we need to be putting the money into supporting uh, BIPOC trans students. Um, we need to be starting scholarships. We need to be taking a systemic approach to the change we wanna see. My whole day is like queerness. Like this morning I gave a like, I'm leaving my workplace and going somewhere new. So I, I was like, my gift to y'all is like, this is going to be such a queer affirming space. Um, and let's do a two hour training on LGBTQIA um, trauma and youth um, and just celebrating, you know, this amazing community. So y'all, this is like really in your hands. You can go into those um, field work experiences and you have a project at the end and you need to talk about a case study, make it long transplant, but also queer, like, you know, just embed what, what you're already doing. This is OT, right? These are humans, therefore it is like part of our work. So we just embed it into the work that we're already doing and weave in people's identities, which also include their gender identity and sexual orientation. I'll get off my soapbox, but yes, I could talk about this all day. <laughs> Such important stuff. Um, so one of the things that is integral to social work is activism and social justice. And it's funny, a couple times when I was getting my master's, people brought up like, are clinicians really even social workers? Because there isn't that like required component of going to lobby day and lobbying for change. And that's like it, it, this own internal struggle within the social work community to figure out, but that's always been something that has been so important to me. And one of the things that like I highly encourage everyone as students and practitioners to be a part of the legislative change, to go to lobby day, to keep an eye on what kind of laws are being passed in Rhode Island alone there's a great bill coming, there's a bill coming to the floor to be proposed to ban um, um, surgery for intersex kid, like kids at birth. And, but there's also a sports ban for trans kiddos too. So <laughs> 
there's so much that doesn't come to the forefront that you need to make that specific effort to keep involved um, and know about what specific legislation is happening within your own state, but also realizing you come from a position of power within your own profession. You get to take advantage of like, I'm a clinician, I'm an OT, I'm a doctor, because you have that extra level of like, so, like legislators will take you a little bit more seriously. So use that power as a doctor, an OT, a clinician, go to lobby day, fight for the bullshit that is being passed right now against the bullshit that's being passed right now, not for it. Sorry. <laughs> but yeah, that's my, that's one of the biggest things that I wanted to say is that don't, don't forget that the courts are still there and don't forget that you have a voice. All right, I'll go. I've got five tips, suggestions for y'all. Um, I'm gonna try to keep them brief. The first one we've already talked about, um, Nuria like previewed this for us around um, the context, the normalizing um, lack of safety for queer and trans folks, I think especially for trans folks, just because of the ways in which their survival for folks who um, need medical transition, their livelihood and their well-being, their survival often depends on the whims of the healthcare system. So like just understanding and like normalizing any sort of aloofness or guardedness or whatever your clinic calls it uh, and hopefully a depathologizing way um, that this can be a survival skill and is nothing to do with you. Um, I mean, although of course use it as an opportunity to reflect on what you could do differently, but don't make it about you, you know, as a provider um, and, you know, just keep working on creating an environment of support and affirmation. And like I said, that guard will drop when it no longer is felt like it's needed. Um, my second tip for you um, beyond kind of like depathologizing and contextualizing the kind of like understandable defensiveness and kind of like uncertainty for, for queer and trans and healthcare settings is um, to, um, to remember that for queer and trans folks, witnessing other queer and trans people surviving and even thriving is healing. So look for opportunities in the settings that you're in to create protected identity spaces for queer and trans folks to share support with each other. Um, if your organization doesn't have someone who has those identities or has someone who has those identities who doesn't necessarily wanna be the provider for that space, the facilitator for that space, um, do a lot of work on figuring out how you're gonna navigate that in a way. Like, like if you're a cishet person facilitating a queer and trans identity space, like be transparent about your reality. Um, I had someone tell me one time, a facilitator, like I like, to, I like to just have this like blank screen and let them project onto me whatever they think. And I was like, I'm gonna stop you right there. <laughs> That's everyday life. <laughs> we don't need this on our healing spaces, like check your privilege. Um, but yeah, so, so um, find ways to have community spaces for healing and be mindful of who holds power and privilege in that space if, if that has to happen. Um, my third suggestion is to, when you are working with clients, um, and I don't know the OT language, so I'm gonna use the psychology language for this, forgive me, um, but assess for your client's resilience strategies um, and support them in building those. So like when we are assessing for what their needs are, when we're treatment planning, always, always hold yourself accountable to assessing for resilience. It's not irrelevant. It's deeply relevant. It's the most relevant. So, um, you know, there's research has shown some, right? So we know that tend to be things like um, community connectedness, identity pride are pretty common ones. Um, but everyone also has their own unique resilience strategies that reflects them as a person and their values. Like for me, like I need to listen to queer D&D podcasts and find out for your clients what theirs is, what's their resilience strategy and actively support them in that. Um, isolation is real for a lot of the folks that I work with. So really 
this might be the first time that they've considered that the world might feel different for them if they had more support and more resilience. So um, my fourth suggestion is to ask the um, local queer and trans community for feedback on what they need rather than making assumptions. Um, pay them for their feedback. It's been mentioned earlier, super important. And also hold yourself accountable to actually do stuff with what they tell you, right? Um, so take action on their feedback and including making systemic changes, not just individual changes to the work that you do one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and my last suggestion for y'all is to learn more, especially if you don't identify within the LGBTQ plus community, learn more about the nuances of queer and trans culture beyond reading books and academic writing. So like watch media created by queer and trans people, listen to their podcasts, follow them on social media. There's so much about the lived experience and the culture that you'll never know just from research articles. So I strongly recommend that. Yes, wonderful things and um, echoing everything that's already been said. Um, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, being aware of our own biases and assumptions and realizing that like being an ally isn't a status. This isn't a, oh, I'm wearing my ally sash. I, I did good today. Um, it is an active process. It is an ongoing process. It is uh, continually challenging yourself to recognize um, these, these systems and how you're perpetuating them and causing harm. Um, and so, it's a lot of work. It really is. And it's hard work. It's not pleasant, especially if you come from a place of a lot of privilege. Um, and so I would encourage you when you feel uncomfortable, when you get a knee jerk reaction and you saw someone that like dis doesn't fit your what you think a gender should look like, and you're just like, oh, like what, what's going on? That's a, that's a moment. That's your body telling you that is an area to learn more. Lean into that discomfort and ask yourself, why was I uncomfortable? You know, what, what assumptions do I have about how the world should work that made me feel uncomfortable? Um, and that, again, it's ongoing. It's every day for the rest of your life. This is the work you should be doing. Um, you know, the areas which you feel the least comfortable are the areas for the most growth. And so I, I would encourage you to, to think of it as a, a process. And um, I, I, all, I heard this from the indigenous community who uh, told me, like, you know, they... It's the, uh, we want you to be an accomplice, not an ally. And so thinking about it from that framework too, it's not just about, oh, being an ally and, and you know, okay, I'm, I'm looking at how my, my behaviors are perpetuating certain things, but rather I want you to be an accomplice on that side, on the picket line, you know, like I want um, you know, be a part of the, the movement actively to make these changes. Um, and always defend your, your clients. And this happens, I mean, unfortunately, um, semi-regularly, or at least when I was doing more clinical stuff before I switched to research, but, um, you know, like standing up for your patients whenever it, like the doctor misgenders them, you're like, you're like, no, 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 we're, we're not allowing that. We're not, we're going to stop, shut that down right now. And even when that person's not there, you know, if someone makes a mistake, if you make a mistake, you correct it right away. Um, so those, I think there's some tangible things to, to think about moving forward. Can I squeeze in again? I'm so sorry to take up more space, but I just have a few things after everyone was talking that I had to say. So, I'm, okay, I'm going for it. Um, so a few more things that I would like y'all to consider is A, you have an organization within the OT profession called the Network for LGBTQIA Concerns in Occupational Therapy. Please consider uh, joining, following. We have a motion to the RA um, to publish a statement on conversion therapy that we do not support it because it is harmful, right? So we are trying to do things and it would be amazing for y'all to spread the word um, in your universities and join yourselves and learn more through that. Also echoing like follow folks um, on social media. There are also great OTs who are doing the work. One of them is a good friend, Dev, the Rainbow OT. Highly recommend following them and their content. They're also involved with COTAD. Um, also, you know, we don't wear badges of like allyship. However, there are also, um, you know, pins, symbols, um, little things for me personally, like I can breathe easy when I see um, a pin or a rainbow flag or something um, that lets me know that this space may be safe. Now, we don't just throw on a pin and then assume that the work is done. There is deep ongoing work that needs to happen, but um, considering how we're making a space safe and then 
you know, wearing that pin so folks can know that you may be someone they can approach um, can also be helpful. And one last thing I promise. Um, so it is important to know that, you know, especially um, for youth, like the, the data does tell us that if a person has at least one, one support in their life, like this could be one affirming person, it doesn't have to be their birth family or, you know, someone at school, it could also be like you or someone that they are receiving like healthcare from that can drastically change the trajectory of their life and self-harm and suicide. So it is really important to know that, you know, there are real opportunities to make changes. Um, and, and this stuff is um, really that important. Okay, I'll be quiet. Thank you. I think that now we're going to get to hear some of the questions y'all have been sending in, which are fire, by the way. Thank you so much for being such active participants, active, engaged listeners. And I know that there are other people who have helped put this event together that are going to share the questions. Hello everyone, um, my name is Jessica. I'm gonna go ahead and read a couple questions and thank you, we've had such great um, questions coming in. So for time's sake, uh, we just invite any of the panelists that wanna join in and answer the question. Um, but one of the first questions that we did have uh, was for Brett and they would love to hear more uh, on your voice work with queer and trans people. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I. To me, our, our, our voices are so unique and tied to our identity. Um, and so I, I really my cent focus and center my practice on what is that person's voice that is that, you know, the, that they buried away. And so I don't prescribe gender norms or, oh, well, if you want to be read this way, you have to be within this frequency. And you, I say your voice, your voice is a toolbox. You have your like flirty voice that you use. And then you have your like, here's my straight voice. Oh, no, nah, man, I didn't watch the game last night. Like these are tools that I have for in situations when I don't feel safe, right? And so I help people expand their toolbox to use a voice that feels good for them, that has them read the way they want to be read rather than saying, you need to do this. I say, we're gonna explore a ton of different things. You mix and match until you're happy. And that's how I approach it. That was um, excellent, Brett. My name is Tiara, and um, I'm just gonna ask the next question, which um, the question is, is there any reason to not ask someone's pronouns like at the beginning of working with someone and anyone can like join in to, if they think they have something to add to that? I got, I get this question a lot at work. Um, cis people want any excuse they just are like, please, uh, how about this situation? Oh, no, no, this situation. I'm like, no, no, every time. <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm, you know, like I mentioned, I'm currently at the VA and I've actually memorized the exact VA directive number that requires providers to use the correct name and pronouns for veterans. Because I just say like, well, if you want to be in compliance with the VA directive, um, you can't know someone's pronouns by looking at them like Nuria has like, continue to remind us, which is, I don't think can be said enough. So, so now um, I've gotten questions like, what if someone is in an active psychotic state? No, you still share your pronouns and ask theirs. Um, what if someone um, has a Trump hat on? No, you still do it. Um, and I would say, especially cis providers. Um, and I'm also gonna say, I've been calling out cis people a lot. And if you're having discomfort with that, take note and do some work. Um, is it my tone or is it because you don't like being aware of a gap between maybe like I mentioned earlier, kind of where you're at and where you wanna be. So just throwing that out there for anyone who's like, Jasper doesn't like cis people. It's like, well, no, <laughs> hold on. <laughs> um, I'm offering you feedback. So so yeah, so um, I'm gonna give a strong no to that. I have yet to be uh, informed of a clinical situation where it'd be contraindicated to talk about pronouns. Jasper, can I like kind of ask a question and also just, um, you know, thinking about this um, and I've been thinking about it a lot. We are actually working on a like a pronoun campaign also through the network and 
Um, so, okay, so a few things. So one, I'm thinking about a group setting um, and how folks may feel. Um, yeah, I, I'm really still wrapping my thoughts around this, but um, providing a, a space for folks to identify prior to entering a group setting what pronouns you know they want to be using in that group setting um, or if they feel comfortable like sharing pronouns at the beginning of group um, and how they would like you as the provider to respond. I'm also thinking about teachers who are doing this in the classroom. Um, yeah, I'm just wondering like your thoughts on group process and pronouns and what your approach is to that. Yeah, so I, um, my teaching is in healthcare settings, so I can speak more to groups though. So in groups, I am aware that like not necessarily disclosing your pronoun might be a safety behavior. So what I'll say is in the introductions, I will always share my pronouns um, and I will say, and if you'd like to share yours too in the intro introduction, right, I'll say like, in the introduction, I'll say like, share your name, your pronouns, if you want, and then one thing you're hoping to get from the space or whatever the thing is that day. So that if is there as an out for folks. Um, so that's what I do in group settings. Yeah, but when I'm one-on-one -on -one with folks, I'll ask. Um, right, yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah, that's also kind of the way that I approach things. And then um, I think that in terms of y'all's faculty and kind of asking for changes in the universities also. So like similarly, I think that if um, there is a way to um, have that conversation before the first day and like roll call being done and then like misgendering happening and um, stuff like that, then that is the way to go about it. But yeah, just echoing what Jasper said. Thank you. Uh, we also invite Kelsey wanted to ask a question. Um, so, Hello. Um, first, Jasper, I think at some point you should drop the D&D uh, &D queer podcast in the chat because a few of us are very interested. <laughs> but so I work with Shannon and um, a number of months back we had um, I was working with a trans youth for the first time and I actually reached out to Nuria asking what I can do as a queer provider to both support my client, but also protect my own health and safety and how I can continue to support them while potentially dealing with um, like the parents point of view. Cause it was a lot of parent education going on um, and a non supportive family, non affirming family at that. So Nuria, I thought it was just such great advice that I know that there are a number of queer students in this group that will be healthcare practitioners. So I'd like to ask you if you could share some tips to take care of yourself as a practitioner within the community as well, or anyone else that is willing to talk about it. I'm just thinking coming from an OT lens, it's, it might be a little different. Yeah, I mean, I feel like <laughs> Maybe other folks are going to have like better advice. I mean, I have like no boundaries and I also take in folks emotions. Um, and I similarly work in like situations where the pain is so deep um, and it is hard. Um, so, you know, back to that, like transference and counter transference um, and really recognizing when things are, you know, starting to, to impact us in a way where you know, we can't really show up um, to support the person in, in like the way that that they need. Um, and then also just, um, yeah, I think like reflecting critically on, you know, are we listening to what the person and the family is telling us or are we projecting like our own like beliefs or like I'll say, I'll speak for myself, my own issues, right? Like, is this a projection? am I hearing the person? Um, am I, um, you know, following their lead and making sure that I'm not pushing in the direction that I believe or assume to be, you know, what they need, want, desire. Um, this is a really, really hard one, honestly. Um, I'm definitely on a learning process myself. Um, and I think that another really strong piece of advice that I would have for you all is like find a sounding board. Um, so folks in your corner who without violating HIPAA, I can really debrief with and do some deep, deep work around, you know, this is 
triggering AF right now? And also, what the hell am I doing? Um, and then, you know, just problem solving together. A lot of this is problem solving. We don't get those manuals. Who said it, Brett? Where is that manual? I need it. Um, we don't get the manuals, right? This is a lot of like trial and error and figuring out together. Um, so just kind of like recognizing that and having like your own support and taking care of yourselves. Um, it's not all easy out there. It It's not not so pretty. Welcome, welcome to the profession. No, <laughs> I should end on a more positive note, but let's hear what other folks have. <laughs> I also just want to say, like, it's okay to be angry. It's okay to scream and like scribble in your notebook and break your pen. Like this, like <laughs> our profession isn't easy. Well. I ours as in like this is a multidisciplinary but like homophobia sucks transphobia sucks racism sucks it's okay to be angry and let out that anger yeah shannon i just like had such a relate moment so i'm like in my notebook, I've written like OMG underline underline like I <laughs> that's happened. Um, and yeah, so that can be a way that I cope. So I just really saw myself on what you said, but um, yeah, I'll echo what Nuria uh, suggested around finding spaces where you feel like you can consult in an affirming way. Um, where I'm currently at professionally, I don't really have folks I can consult with that I don't trust to fully not. Uh, contribute to me internalizing any of the transphobia or queerphobia. And that's just a function of the professional setting I'm in. They've got a lot of growth to do in terms of where they're at with that. Um, so I have actively tried to find spaces, like I've got like trans colleagues at different VAs across the country and we've got a group chat. And I know that like, if I share with them and consult with them about something, like I'm gonna get feedback that centers my experience and doesn't imply somehow that like I just didn't do a right or I'm too sensitive or whatever that might be that would make me internalize it further. Um, and then um, when I work with family members, which is not super often, you know, being in a VA, I mostly work with adults, but um, sometimes folks will, uh, when they find out that their therapist is queer, be like, oh, hold on, let me pull in this person who has a queer kid and has some questions for you. And I'm just like, okay, I guess now I'm doing family therapy. Um, but I try to often, even if they say pretty awful things, reframe it as a lack of knowledge for them and be like, you know what, that's actually a common thing I hear from people who just don't have a lot of experience with this. You know, how do you feel about maybe like me sending you some resources and you can learn a bit and then we can chat again, you know? So I, I try to um, reframe their hate as a lack of knowledge first. Um, and that's not always the case, right? There are gonna be people out there who are just hateful. Um, and when it involves youth, that's gonna, of course, bring up even more stuff. But, um, but that's something I do is I'll just kind of uh, normalize it for them. And be like, you know, it's a common thing that I hear, which is true. I hear biphobic and transphobic things all the time. Uh, and, you know, offer, offer, uh, see if they, and kind of that like um, motivational interviewing tactic of like, how do you feel about this? How would you, would you is this something you want to do? Like get their buy in before I make a suggestion that I know they need. So for sake of time, I know that we would all love to spend the rest of our night on Zoom talking about these things, but we should probably eat and tend to our bio needs. Um, it's my immense honor and pleasure to extend my gratitude to each panelist. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you for your vulnerability to share. Thank you for the wisdom that you really, really brought, I felt the fire in a way that I needed. I had been feeling quite diminished and depleted personally. So thank you so much for being your authentic selves. Thank you for sharing of your lived experiences. I aspire to be the kind of clinicians that y'all obviously are. Thank you to all of my co-hosts. Thank you to my fellow co-taddians, um, my chapters. This was a really fun national event. We're spanning all the way from Louisiana up to the tip top of the country and then out to Florida as well. 
Thank you so much uh, to everyone of you who've tuned in and listened and submitted all of your questions. I wish we had had more time. This event was recorded, so it will be accessible for folks who couldn't attend or maybe who had accessibility needs and will want to rewatch, or for me personally, for my own personal pleasure, will want to go and rewatch. Um, yeah, I'm blown away by this. I also just want to give an offering. So I actually uh, host a transgender nonconforming occupational therapist meetup, and we meet virtually once a month, and it's really, really sweet. And we span many countries. There are many of us. Um, if that is of interest to you, go ahead and just DM me and I can send you the information. It's really sweet. We share moments where we've been misgendered by somebody in some context. Um, and then everybody rallies and like says the person's name and says their pronouns and it feels really sweet. Um, yeah, so all that to say, this was incredible. I'm so, so honored to be in a space and to call you my people. And I hope that everyone feels like they learned something and that we all have that room to grow. We're all continually learning how to do our very best. So with that, without further ado, I'm gonna use my dear friend's phrase, which is you don't have to go home, but you can't stay here, which is like probably the funniest Zoom thing that I could end with. Thanks y'all. I right, thank you.